Microphone check. If you can hear me, let me know. Hi there guys, we'll be starting in five minutes.
Hey everybody, welcome to Goldendale Observations number 11. This is Troy Carpenter coming to you live from the glorious new Goldendale Observatory State Park. And uh, we're going to be talking about electromagnetism tonight. When you hear that term, you might think of uh, man-made objects like technology. A lot of our technology is electromagnetic in nature. But actually, no, we'll be talking about naturally occurring electromagnetic fields, including those generated by planets, stars, entire galaxies. We'll be talking about the magnetic fields generated by stellar remnants, that is to say dead stars, and a lot of other things in between. We'll also be addressing the fact that Earth's magnetic field changes, and we'll be dispelling some ridiculous myths regarding that change. So, that being said, I hope you can all hear and see me. And uh, I can't really predict how long this particular show is going to go tonight. We have a lot of material to cover, but some of it's pretty basic. I strongly encourage, as always, everybody watching to ask questions and also uh, make comments, if they're nice, if they're appropriate comments. And uh, we will hopefully get done under reasonable time. Uh, I want to repeat, please ask questions, please make comments. That's how we tailor these presentations to your educational needs. Uh, briefly, before we get right down to it, I'm going to do what I've been doing the last few weeks and interrupt the uh, show briefly just so I can talk about the Great Conjunction, which I believe I have a picture of. Just hold that thought. The, uh, the show still goes on. The show continues, so to speak. Here's a picture. So this was taken on the 22nd of December, so the day after the Great Conjunction. And as you can see, we have beautiful, bright Jupiter there, and then to his right, Saturn. You can also see the bright dots of two of Jupiter's four famous Galilean moons. I keep bringing this up because you still have a chance to see it, although it is getting quite low now. So if you haven't yet seen the pair, make sure you look immediately after sunset, and again, look to the southwest. Uh, briefly, any questions about that? Then we're going to move into the show properly. Questions about the Great Conjunction. I hope uh, more of you have gotten to see it, those of you who are watching right now. I'm watching the chat. All right, then. Fine with me. Let me go back to my big head there. So, we, uh, we're we going to start by discussing a little bit of electrical theory as it, as it pertains to everyday grade school science. Uh, some of you might know a few things about electromagnetism. Some of you might know things about magnets in general. Some of you might know a few things about these as a compass. I don't know if we have any scouts watching the show tonight. So before we, before we hope to understand cosmological electromagnetic fields, it's important to understand those that we have access to on Earth. Let's start with a picture of some lodestone. So this is lodestone. It's been known for thousands of years to be magnetic. Humans noticed that this particular material would attract iron. It is, in fact, iron. It is a form of iron ore known as magnetite. Most of you have probably heard of magnetite. And it is naturally magnetic. You could think of it as a permanent magnet. However, when we talk about planetary magnetic fields, they are not resultant from material like this. Now, that's important to point out because as recently as the mid-20th century, we were still telling people that planets and other bodies had magnetic fields because of deposits of iron, especially near their surface, which is very incorrect. I just wanted to point that out, that there are indeed naturally occurring magnets. And humans have used them for a long time. And you probably know one of the many uses is direction finding, using, again, a compass. So let's, let's get permanent magnets out of the way so we can talk about the magnets of interest during this show. So here we have a bar magnet, and you can see that someone has sprinkled black dust all over it. Who can tell me what that black material is? Is it dirt? Is it sand? What do you think? What is that black stuff? There's a reason it's been sprinkled all over that magnet. Iron, that's right, specifically iron filings. Why iron? Why not dirt? Dirt's cheaper. Or sand. Someone tell me, why would you use iron? Hi. Watching, watching the chat. 
Why not? Oh, even let's be more ridiculous. Why not aluminum? Iron. Why? Well, I keep seeing iron shavings, but how come? Why iron? Iron is known for being exceptionally electromagnetically sympathetic. Its charges tend to align readily with electromagnetic fields. And the ability of something to respond to magnetic fields or generate its own is often determined by the polarity of its atoms and, and how orderly they are. If all the atoms are all randomly polarized, pointing every which way, north's over there, north's over there, north's over there, then that material will not be very electromagnetically responsive. But if they're roughly in agreement with each other, then that material will often be magnetic. However, even if you have a material that is considered magnetic, it can lose that magnetism if you make it too hot. So for example, in the case of iron, there's a certain temperature, 1,417 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's just say, let's just say 1,400 degrees. So at about 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit, iron loses its magnetic sympathy because the atoms are now so agitated by their kinetic motion that they're no longer able to line up. There's a reason I'm telling you that. That's going to come up in a few minutes. Yeah, so something can lose its magnetism, even if it's considered magnetic, if you make it too hot. Now, oh, finally, someone answered. Thank you. So Ed here, he has pointed out that we sprinkled iron filings all over the mag magnet to reveal the invisible lines of electromagnetic flux. Obviously, electromagnetic fields are invisible. And you cannot see them, although we can measure them. If you want to visualize them, you have to do something like this. You have to essentially observe something trapped within the matrix of magnetic fields in order to plot them or map them. Now, that's assuming you cannot be in their midst. If you're standing within a magnetic field, then you can measure it with a magnetometer, and you could draw a very accurate map of the magnetic field without needing to suspend material within it. Any questions about that? I'm going to keep moving on, but feel free to ask one about that. Some of you may have done this in school. Some of you may have done experiments like this and found that it makes quite a mess. You'll also find that you will never get those darn iron filings off of the magnet, which is why someone cleverly put a piece of glass on top of this magnet. You can't quite see it, but the iron filings are actually sitting on a piece of glass, which is on top of the magnet. So that way you could just lift the glass off and you don't have a huge mess and you don't have a dirty magnet. Yeah. Now, I already mentioned earlier that we're not really going to talk about permanent magnets tonight, which is what this object is. Because permanent magnets are essentially never the source of strong magnetism when it comes to planetary bodies, stars, etc. Electromagnetism, as I said, is often associated with technology, but it really shouldn't be. Because it is completely natural for electrical current flow to generate a magnetic field. If electricity is flowing through anything, a magnetic field will be created around that object. And simply this is because as the electrons move from atom to atom to atom within the material, it compels them to line up. The electron flow direction is very determinate in how strong the magnetic field is. If the electrons are all going in roughly the same direction, the field will be much stronger. Questions about that? And Etch-a-Sketch, oh good! So yeah, Etch-a-Sketch is... Uh, they, I, you know, I think they might use static cling, but I might be wrong about that. Uh, but they uh, certainly do use powder, which you scratch to your little drawings into. I had an etch sketch when I was a kid. I, I like those. I think they're very clever devices. They've been around for a long time. Okay, so let me demonstrate the generation of a magnetic field via electrical current flow. So we have a coil of wire here. We're going to turn on... The voltage and current flows through it, and look what's happening to the iron filing. See that, guys? So, simply the act of passing electrical current through this wire has generated a magnetic field powerful enough to attract those iron filings and cause them to line up. Now, the reason that the wire is coiled up is simple. This is one of the most important inventions in the history of invention, the inductor. And it's also one of the absolute simplest inventions in the history of invention because an inductor is literally just a coil of insulated wire. The reason the wire is insulated, if it weren't, then the electrons would just go wherever they want between the different turns. But because the wire is insulated, the electrons are forced to go through the wire and go around and around and around and around. And what happens is simple. The magnetic fields produced by the electrons flowing through the wire overlap each other and that greatly increases their strength. Inductors can be used to do useful work, 
because we have essentially caused the magnetic fields to overlap each other and amplify their strength. Now, when I say useful work, I want you guys to tell me. Think of some applications for this technology. I want to see some examples. And I hope you can provide some, because this is fundamental to everyday life in this modern world we live in. Thin enamel insulation, that's right. Yeah, I'm glad you point out the fact that it's thin, because people often see wire like this and think that it's, it's not there. They don't think the insulation exists, but in fact, it's just transparent. So someone tell me, give me an example of an everyday life application of this technology. And it's not hard, because the list is long, and most of the objects on that list are very common. Mm. Okay, someone said electric motor. There are inductors and ham radios. Okay, so the inductors and ham radios can be used for filtration. They can be used for transformation. Someone mentions motors, of course. We can move an armature using electromagnetic fields, doing useful work that way. Ah, very good, automobile coil. So an ignition coil in a car can produce high voltage via the rapid collapse of a magnetic field being created by an inductor. By the way, they call it an ignition coil because it's full of coiled up wire. Ah, generators, good. That's interesting. So a spinning device using coils can be a motor or a generator. That's important. Transformers are kind of like stationary generators, you know, because you're changing a magnetic field and causing induction on another winding. That word induction is important. We're talking about electromagnetic induction. If you move a magnet around an inductor, the magnetic field will cause the electrons within the wire to line up, and you can create voltage and, of course, therefore, compel current to flow. If you, if you instead force current through the wire, you create a magnetic field that may or may not be able to do useful work. Any questions about that? Now, of course, as I said, this is an invention. Humans invented inductors, but they're taking advantage of an extraordinary natural ability the ability of electrons flowing in the same direction, or roughly the same direction, to produce useful magnetic fields. So now let me show you the opposite of what's happening in this video. Check this out. Okay, now look, I'm going to pause this. This is an amp meter, so it tells you how much current is flowing through a circuit. We have another inductor here. As you can see, it has a lot of turns in it. And that person just stuck a magnet in there. Watch. We're going to do it again. Notice the red end of the magnet, let's call it north. When they stick it in, the current goes one way. When they pulled it out, it went another. Notice the field, or rather the current, stops flowing when the magnet stops moving. That's important. Now we're going to flip the magnet around. Watch the needle. See that? With the opposite direction. So the magnetic polarity determined the direction the electrons would flow. Again, now they stuck the magnet in there and left it. The current stops flowing. Change is very important. Inductors are an example of a device known as an, a reactor. Now, we're not talking about like a nuclear reactor or a chemical reactor. We're talking about an inductive reactor. In electrical theory, a device that can re react to change is a reactor if it can store energy. Electromagnetic fields can be used to store electrical energy in inductors. And the inductor will actually respond to a change in its magnetic vicinity. So. You can use them, I mentioned, to, to filter circuits and electrical circuits because if, let's say, the voltage on the circuit drops, the magnetic field inside the inductor will collapse, reinducing re voltage on the circuit and leveling it out. So that's an example of filtration. Again, this looks like a piece of technology, but again, we're taking advantage of the natural ability for flowing electrons to produce useful magnetic fields, or in this case, the natural ability for a magnetic field to induce voltages it doesn't have to involve a, a coil of wire. Humans simply did that to increase the efficiency of this process. Are there any questions about that? Yeah, someone's mentioning microamps. So this is certainly not inducing a large amount of voltage or current flow. Uh, this is certainly not going to be uh, conducting dozens of amps or hundreds of amps, like you might see in a car, for example. Now, the motion is very important. I'm going to show you a cool little magic trick. Watch this. We have a copper pipe. You probably know that copper is not considered magnetic. We have our science assistant here. Oh, look, an iron ball. He's going to drop this ball through the copper pipe, and nothing interesting will happen. There you go. Very big deal. As you can see, it took 0.02 seconds for the, for the ball to fall through the copper pipe. 
Now he's going to use a powerful spherical magnet of the exact same size. And what the heck? Look at that. Oh, it's being delayed. How can this be? It took a full four seconds for that magnet to pass through the copper pipe. What is going on? Let's see. If we observe from above, we can clearly see, oh, look at that, that the ball is being suspended within the copper pipe. The reason this is occurring is because the movement of the magnet within that good conductor of copper is inducing voltage, which is causing electrical current to flow through the copper. When electricity flows through the copper, it produces a magnetic field, and that magnetic field resists the motion of the magnetic ball. So look at this. The iron ball falls right through instantly, whereas the magnet ball falls through slowly because it is inducing charge in the copper pipe. I want to repeat, magnetic field normally does not interact strongly with copper, but by moving the magnet over the copper, we induce voltages, which, which, uh, which compels current flow, which creates a magnetic field, which resists the motion of the magnetic ball. Any questions about that? So, pretty quiet chat tonight. That's fine. That's all right. What does this have to do with space stuff? Well, these same principles are at work when you're dealing with the electromagnetic fields of planets and stars. Before I move on a bit, I want to see if there's at least one question. Are there any, is anyone baffled by this? Is anyone confused by any of this? Well, that's true. But that's a pretty broad statement. Conservation of energy, that could, that could apply to kinetic energy. Oh, that's, that's, oh, someone asked a great question. How many loops of wire does it take for this to work? Uh, well, actually, none. So you could actually create a magnetic field with electricity with, with a straight wire. It will just be weak. The more turns you employ, the more layers, if you will, of electromagnetism overlap each other and the stronger the field becomes. So you increase the efficiency. You're seeing it right now. There's a copper pipe, a straight pipe, which is not exactly considered a good conductor, an inductor, yet it's able to do something useful. Okay. Let's talk about Earth. Good old planet Earth. Our beautiful planet. Earth has a powerful magnetic field, at least as magnetic fields go. It's not the strongest in our solar system, but it is one of the stronger fields. Oh, that's a good question. Hey, hold that, qu hold that thought, because we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Someone asked, how do magnetic fields repel solar radiation? Um, we'll get to that. That's a big deal. That's part of the show for sure. Now, uh, oh, so that's a good question. Someone asked, does the size of the magnet matter regarding speed? Yes, for multiple reasons. If the magnet is physically larger, it will be closer to the copper, and that will increase the efficiency of electromagnetic coupling. Also, if the, ma if the uh, ball is more powerfully magnetic, it will also affect this. That experiment you just saw is best achieved using a very high quality and relatively expensive magnet. If you use, like, for example, a refrigerator magnet, it won't be so impressive. It's a good question. Oh, so someone asked about gravity. It's important to understand that gravity and electromagnetism are different natural forces. They are easily the two most famous. And you could have a debate about which one is more famous. I would argue probably gravity is more famous than magnetism. Although I have observed people using the two interchangeably, the two terms, and you absolutely should not do that because these are very different things. So gravity is a function of mass. Mass experiences gravity due to its curvature of space-time. Thank you, Einstein, for figuring that out. And thank you, Newton, for doing the math long before Einstein. But electromagnetism, that is the stuff of photons. Photons are a quanta of electromagnetic energy, which behave like a particle or a wave. You think of photons as light, but they're not limited to visible light. Electric fields or electromagnetic fields can exist around all manner of things, and they can induce, there's that word again, voltages and currents on materials. We're talking about electromagnetism versus gravity. And I, I will avoid talking about gravity too much in this show because we are trying to learn about electromagnetism, although it will probably come up again in a few minutes when we talk about some particularly extreme objects. Okay, so Earth. As I said some, uh, earlier, we used to be told some things that were incorrect about Earth. We were told that Earth has a magnetic field because of deposits of iron at the poles. Actually, this Earth is a little crooked. At the poles. That is not the case. Most of you at this point in history probably know 
that electromagnetism of our planet is resultant from activity deep within, in the core. Here's a cool picture of our planet's anatomy. You might know the basic structures here. So we have the inner core and the outer core. A lot of people don't know we have a two-phase core with two distinct sections. We have the mantle, and of course we have the crust where we all live. Now, the mantle is often referred to as molten or liquid, although I mentioned it in a different video that if you were to encounter the mantle, if you had a heat suit on so you could survive the heat, you would find that it was indistinguishable from solid rock. The only reason why this material can behave in an amorphous manner is because there is an incredible amount of weight crushing down on it, and so something like the earth solid crust can skate along on this mostly solid material. And the reason it's less solid than the crust is, of course, because it's hotter. Notice that in this artistic representation, as we get deeper into the planet, the color temperature seems to go up. And that's, that's a very good depiction. It's a very accurate depiction because that's exactly what's going on. So Earth's core is about 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Obviously, the surface is not that hot. Uh, by the way, Earth's core, our inner core, is about the size of our moon, so it's about a quarter of the size of our planet, where the outer core is about the size of the planet Mars. Interesting. So inner core about the size of Earth's moon, outer core roughly the size of planet Mars. So someone just asked that about the uh, mantle. Yes, yeah, so I think we answered that. Now, this may baffle you, because the hottest part of our planet is the core, at again, 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and yet it's not molten. This may further surprise you when you learn that the inner and outer core are both comprised of the same material, mostly iron, with a bunch of other metallic impurities, including lots of nickel and some rare elements. We'll talk about that, but mostly iron. So how could it be that the inner core is solid and the outer core is molten if the inner core is hotter? Let's see if you can tell me. How could it be that the inner core would be solid? What do you think about that? Oh, that's an interesting question. Someone asked, how can the core temperature be estimated? Oh, very good. Someone said it. Even though it's so hot, the extremely high pressure is to, to blame. You would be amazed. There are, uh, what is it? I think I wrote down, 50 million pounds per square inch of pressure in the core. That's because of the weight of our planet crushing down upon it. That pressure is what keeps it in a solid phase. That being said, the molten core will not remain molten forever. It is slowly cooling and exchanging energy with the inner core. That energy does slowly escape. And the source of the heat is very interesting. And this will help to answer how we know how hot it is. Let's go over it. There are three mechanisms that are responsible for the heat of Earth's core. Let's see if you guys can list them. I bet you can. List for me the three mechanisms that heat the interior of our planet. That's true. Earth's core has a lot of gold in it. That's right. It has a lot of what we call siderophilic elements, which are elements that are iron-loving. That's what siderophilic means. And they essentially ride the iron down to the core during the formation of a body. Many precious elements and also some radioactive elements. Hold that thought. So, hint, hint. Let's see. Someone tell me, why is the core of our planet hot? And there are multiple answers, so you probably won't get it wrong. Someone tell me. Pressure is one of them. Good. So pressure is one of the reasons that the core is so hot. Good. That's one reason. But it's not the number one reason. It's not the primary reason. Anyone else? Gravity is actually what's responsible for the pressure. So that's the same answer. Someone said gravity. That's good. So we got one out of three so far. Pressure. Rotation. Hmm, that's interesting. So friction. That's an interesting answer. I guess you could add that as a fourth. That wasn't what I was going for. But some of the friction created by rotation may contribute to the heat in a, in a minor way. Ah, radioactive decay. A lot of people don't know this, but that is the primary source of Earth's internal temperature. You could think of Earth as being nuclear powered because that core is not just full of iron. Like I said, it also has lots of other rare elements that are much heavier, including uranium. And uranium is, of course, naturally radioactive. It is naturally unstable. It naturally decays into thorium and lead. And the waste heat from that process is the primary source of Earth's internal heat. This is not unique to the Earth. Other heavy, rocky objects, other, any, pretty much any massive body in our cosmos, will contain the heaviest elements near the center. 
but the amount that you have determines how long that mechanism can run and keep things molten. In the case of Mars, for example, we know that he had a similar mechanism at some distant past time, but that mechanism has since collapsed. Good question, good, good answer. Oh, that's true, yes. So one of the decay uh, products of uranium is helium. And that's actually how Earth collects helium in big pockets until we humans dig it up, you know, and let it out. Uh, unfortunately, we've wasted a lot of our helium. And we're not going to get it back quickly because it takes millions of years for the helium to accumulate under the Earth's crust. But that's a good answer. So helium is one of the byproducts of that decay process. Another one is radon. You've all heard of radon gas. Some people actually have fans in their basements intended to blow the radon out. And radon is another one of those examples of decay elements. And by the way, it's common in houses that are built on granite or bedrock because granite contains a relatively substantial ratio or percentage of uranium. Good, good answer. So that was good. I like someone. I'm glad that someone brought up the uh, helium. So the cool is the core is indeed cooling, and it is definitely not heating up and its temperature is dropping, and this does indeed change its behavior. We predict in some distant time future, the core will solidify and freeze, just like Mars is did. So I didn't hear the third mechanism responsible for the heat, but I'll, so I'll just tell you. Residual heat from the formation of our planet, and also cataclysmic events, like, for, for example, perhaps the collision of Theia. Remember that? Theia, the great body that smacked our planet and made the moon, most likely. So violent events like that, leave behind an enormous amount of thermal energy, and it cannot easily escape a densely packed object like a planet. There's just so much material in a planet that it's hard for heat to escape. So some of the heat in our, in our Earth, deep beneath our feet, is old heat from the formation of the planet over four and a half billion years ago. This gives you an example on how, of how long things can stay hot in the cosmos if, they're, if they have trouble radiating it out. And in this case, it's difficult for the thermal energy to reach the surface. So we got... Residual energy, residual heat, we have pressure, and the number one source of thermal energy within our planet, natural radioactive decay of uranium. And, and by the way, also potassium. Interesting. So there's, there's other elements that are radioactive too besides just uranium that produce heat. Interesting. If you were to measure it, you would discover that terawatts, so trillions of watts of energy are being generated at any given moment, naturally, deep beneath our feet by this radioactive decay. Makes us a little jealous, you know, because we build nuclear power plants on Earth's surface intending to do the same thing. You know, extract heat energy from nuclear decay or radioactive decay. Fun. Questions about that? So now, um, the, the fact that we have this interface between a molten outer core and a solid inner core leads to some interesting uh, convection. Watch this. This is a very impressive video simulation. By the way, there's nothing really behind my head there. It just says Earth's core, so I'm going to cover that up. So this is quite impressive. This is a supercomputer simulation of convection within the outer core. That motion is being driven not only by the heat of the core radiating outward, but also the rotation of our planet and the Coriolis effect. We can measure the radioactive decay of uranium. We can even measure what parts of the planet it's occurring within, including this, in this case, the moving uh, outer core, thanks to the radiation of neutrinos. So neutrinos are ultra low mass particles that move at the speed of light and they pass right through our planet. We build neutrino observatories for observing outer space objects like the sun and supernova explosions, but our own planet emits them, geo-neutrinos. And to answer someone's questions earlier, this is one of the ways we know exactly or very close to how hot the interior is. So I wanted to get to that question. So this motion you see, again, is being driven not just by convection, but also the rotation of our planet. And you might see there seems to be a sort of rotation in the material. What's also interesting is the supercomputer simulation indicates not just temperature differences, but also material differences. For example, we see plumes of iron leaving the inner core and mixing into the outer core, continuously enriching it in, essentially, if you will, new iron. This energy transfer is slowly cooling the outer core. Eventually, it will solidify. And when that occurs, Earth's magnetic field will shut down because it is the motion and the interaction between these two constructs that provides our magnetic field. I'm going to tell you more about that in a second. But already you might be surprised by something, because I mentioned earlier that materials will lose their magnetism or their magnetic properties if they get too hot. 
8,000 degrees is a lot hotter than 1,400 degrees. So the iron here in this, in this simulation is certainly too hot to become magnetized. And yet our iron core seems to be responsible for a powerful magnetic field. And this is because electrical current is flowing. Trillions of watts of electrical energy are flowing through the core because of the motion of a highly conductive material iron within powerful magnetic fields, which essentially already existed and are also being actively generated by other iron. So you have material iron interacting with other iron and also nickel and other conductive materials and producing a sort of generator. This is the geodynamo, and many of you have probably heard that term. This is the true origin of Earth's magnetic field. Not because of permanent magnets or because of material or specifically a specific identity of material, but because of electrical current flowing through the core in this highly energetic environment. Trillions of amps, geodynamo, yes. Questions about that? So someone asked, would the Earth still stay warm if the sun were to disappear? No, the surface would cool down very quickly. Ironically, the interior would stay hot for eons of time. We don't really have access to this at much energy directly. However, you may have heard of geothermal energy, including a, an exciting technology called enhanced geothermal, where we, we drill extremely deep wells into the earth and take advantage of the heat within. Some of you might know that if you dig deep enough, you have a constant temperature all year round. However, near the surface, that's still, it's still partly moderated by solar energy. So you'd have to dig down very deeply and deep in order to get a, a survivable or livable temperature without the help of sunlight. Yeah, so, but it's an interesting thing to think about. It is, again, kind of neat to remind, remember that essentially because our Earth is nuclear powered and has most likely hundreds of millions of years left of energy in that, in that regard, you could theoretically live beneath the surface regardless of what the sun is up to. <laughs> Maybe that should be your next survival strategy, to build an impossibly deep well and hide in it. That sounds unpleasant and expensive and difficult and dangerous. A lot of Hollywood movies have made it seem simple. There's, there's multiple uh, adaptations of the famous story, Journey to the Center of the Earth. And in the original story, they literally walked down there. So they literally hiked down into the earth because they found a really deep cave or something. Uh, in the future movies, the movies that were made in the 20th century, they used huge uh, machines with drills and lasers and things that would cut their way down. But that's difficult because not only does the temperature increase as you dig deeper, but the density does as well. So... It might take some magical science fiction technology to do what you see in those movies. Yeah. Questions about that? So I'm going to ask how long until Earth's core cools down. We don't know. Uh, it will do it. It will happen. Probably millions of years. Maybe billions. Here's the good news. If it happens tomorrow, the world will not end. It's true that we'll lose our magnetic field, but that will not destroy everything. We're going to say a few more things about that in a minute. Good question so far. Let's see. Yeah. All right. So because of the chaotic motion that you see here, Earth's magnetic field is not regular. In fact, it's a little bit weird looking. Check it out. This is a map of Earth's magnetic field. And actually, this is the outer core being depicted. And as you can see, the north and the south or the positive and negative, whatever you want to call them, are intermixing the core region. The magnetic fields here are highly complex and dynamic. They're always changing. The change is important because it's actually partly responsible for the electromagnetic induction that makes our magnetic field possible. But sometimes that change causes the magnetic field to do surprising things. Many of you have probably heard of the pole flipping or uh, switching. Uh, we call that a, a geomagnetic reversal. There's also all this famous thing known as a, a, a geomagnetic excursion, which is where the magnetic field will suddenly change dramatically in strength we know that throughout history, Earth's magnetic field has dramatically increased and decreased in strength, and we do know that it's also flipped in polarity. If you want to know the rate, we have determined that it's flipped about 183 times, so 183 times in 84 million years. And if you're wondering how we know that, it's incredibly clever. So when volcanoes erupt, they spew molten rock all over the place. When that molten rock freezes as it cools down and solidifies, it essentially records the orientation of Earth's magnetic field when that rock solidified. And geologists can study rock and dig down through eons worth of strata and actually map out Earth's magnetic field with surprising accuracy. 
simply by measuring the electromagnetic polarization of volcanic rock. It gets more difficult the deeper you go and the farther back in time you get. That's why I mentioned a statistic that was only about 84 million years worth of time. But yeah, our, our uh, field has flipped 183 times in 84 million years. You might try to average that out and think, oh, well, that's about once per every half million years. So we can probably figure out how often it happens. Actually, no. It turns out this process is a lot more uh, chaotic than you might expect. It turns out that Earth's magnetic field is a little more uh, organic, and that's not, not the right word to use, but it's a little more wild than one might expect. If it were regular, then we would be overdue because the last reversal was about 700,000 years ago. So that means we're 200,000 years overdue. But again, these reversals don't happen like clockwork, nor do the excursions. Let me show you. This is what a magnetic reversal looks like. Check this out. Let me move that over. There you go. So you can see the polarity is denoted by the colors orange and blue, and watch what happens here. Whoa! Crazy time. That is a geomagnetic reversal, and that plays out over a period of decades or centuries or millennia, depending on how vigorous it is. Here comes another one. Look, see that? Notice how crazy it is. It's not like a nice, neat blip, blip. By the way, that, that ball in the middle of the simulation is actually the outer core. This is not a random fictional simulation. This is based on data. How does this impact compass north inclination changes over time? Well, it certainly changes the uh, apparent north or south magnetic poles and will render compasses <laughs> useless, worthless, depending on when you're trying to use one. Hold that thought. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Let me show you a little more data-driven example of the same type of simulation. We're going to show you 40,000 years of geomagnetic activity. Oops, sorry. There you go. And center that. So. so notice the strength is also indicated here. So the same kind of data, but this time uh, with an actual date app uh, applied to it. Notice that sometimes the change is very rapid. And that might include those excursions that we talked about. Now, if you look at the top of the world, you'll see that the apparent geomagnetic North Pole seems to be wandering about. Hmm, interesting. So someone asked, is there any technology that relies on the magnetic field being in the correct position? Back in the day, yes. In the, in the 20th century, we made good use of Earth's magnetic field and we, until we realized that it was unreliable because we discovered that it was indeed migrating. Check it out. 1831, 1904, 1948, 1972, 84, 94, 99, 2001, 2003, 2005. As you can see, Earth's magnetic north is wandering. And fairly quickly. It's also accelerating. Notice how the, this, the difference or the distance between the points grows. Notice how it doesn't move in a perfectly straight line either. So someone mentioned ships' compasses. You can use magnets still. You can use magnetometers and compasses still. But they tend to be used in a secondary capacity to help you calibrate other devices, other technologies. That being said, you can make good use of magnetic fields, polarity, for navigation, but you have to know your offset. You have to know the declination for where you live or where you're trying to go. Here in Washington State, it's like 16 degrees. That's quite a big difference. There's quite a difference between the magnetic north and true north. Look at this picture here. So here is a map of the southern and northern hemispheres. And notice that we have a shift, of course, in both. Although, interestingly, the north field is moving much more aggressively, much more uh, uh, quickly than the south. Now, someone asked me a question last week, and I think I misunderstood it when I answered, about the difference between the geomagnetic pole and the magnetic pole. And, and of course, the north pole. So just let's start with the north pole. So true north is here. True south is here. We're not talking about that. Those are the rotational axes that we talked about last week. 
The difference between the magnetic pole and the geomagnetic pole has to do with surface versus outer space measurements. If you were on the surface of Earth, the magnetic pole would be where you measure it to be. But in outer space, we discover that there is an overall averaging of Earth's magnetic field, which slightly disagrees with the individual north and south poles magnetically. So that matters when you're talking about satellites. Satellites care very much. Satellite operators care very much about this. Yeah. Questions about that? Let me go back to this uh, exciting video. This is fun. Should you be concerned about this? No! I love talking about this because it's one of those popular internet hoaxcraft doomsday event things. It's true that it could affect our planet. But even if Earth's magnetic field vanished overnight, and it will eventually do that, our atmosphere would be safe for hundreds of millions of years. The reason I bring up our atmosphere, you might be aware of the fact that the sun strips planets of their atmosphere. Solar wind ablation destroys atmospheres. Mercury has no atmosphere because of this mechanism. Venus has lost all of her lightweight gases, leaving only heavy molecular ones. Mars has lost almost all of his atmosphere. So the, if you want to think of the, a function or purpose, so to speak, of the magnetic field, you might argue that its primary function or purpose is protection of Earth's atmosphere. So that's the number one doomsday scenario, is after the collapse of our field, Earth's atmosphere will be more rapidly stripped by the sun. But again, this will take hundreds of millions of years, so please don't worry about it. It will affect our technology, like we've talked about a bit. It will also affect animals. Apparently there are some uh, birds and fish that navigate geomagnetically. How astonishing. And uh, they might be very confused if Earth's magnetic field were to suddenly change dramatically in orientation or dramatically weaken. I wonder if they would improve, it would actually improve their navigation skills if it got stronger. That would be interesting to think about. Now, someone brings up the aurora. It's a wonderful question. Our planet is constantly bombarded by solar wind. I've used this picture a lot. I apologize if you're, if you're sick of seeing it, although it is a useful drawing. The sun is behind my head in this drawing. Uh, the white snow is solar wind. Now, solar wind is not really wind. It is an endless stream of very high-speed solar ions, mostly hydrogen and helium ions, so charged hydrogen and helium, mostly naked nuclei, that are moving at very great speed, up to 2 million miles per hour. And this is that destructive force we talked about. Now. Earth's magnetic fields can deflect these particles like a shield, but it also traps them and creates the dangerous Van Allen belts. Check this picture out. So we have here a drawing of the two most famous Van Allen belts. Notice uh, this drawing goes out of its way to point out the difference in the magnetic axis and rotational axis, in case we haven't already covered that enough. They do not agree because they're not the same thing. Notice something called the South Atlantic Anomaly. There is a region, and by the way, this is a new feature. This is, a, this is generated, this has occurred over the last few decades, not centuries or millennia. Over the last few decades, we've noticed an increase in radiation in this region right here because Earth's crooked magnetic field disagrees with its rotational axis because it's also off-center a bit. Notice the center here. Notice the yellow dot is off-center from the blue center. So our crooked off-center magnetic field Unfortunately, like a double-edged sword, bring some of those particles closer to Earth because they are attracted to Earth's core and, and they ride these electromagnetic field lines down towards the core. The aurora occur because these particles also strike the upper atmosphere at the poles where the magnetic fields are strong enough or strongest. That's where they mostly intersect our planet. And this is why you'll see the northern lights and the southern lights, the aurora australis, in those regions, because the magnetic field lines are essentially guiding, if you will, the high energy particles towards our atmosphere. I hope, I hope some of you have seen the aurora before. Here's some video of it from the observatory. You'll notice that the aurora tends to manifest these sort of bands and pillars and columns. The reason that occurs is because we're seeing essentially the manifestation of Earth's magnetic field, the invisible lines of electromagnetic flux becoming visible because of plasma air, in this case, nitrogen and oxygen. That's what the pink and green are, by the way. Nitrogen is the pink, green is oxygen. That plasma phenomenon follows those lines of flux 
because that's where the most particles are coming from the sun and striking the upper atmosphere. Are any questions about that? Someone says drawing. Yeah, that's right. Now, here's a better one. Check this out. This was in uh, October of 2000. Actually, yeah, this is October 2016. This is a photograph, not a time lapse. You can very clearly see these discrete pillars of light. Those of you who have actually seen the aurora will often notice these vertical lines. You're kind of seeing what we talked about earlier. Remember the, uh, the, the iron filings around the magnet? Very similar to that. Here's a really good show. This was in uh, May of 2016. This was impressive because like half the sky was glowing. Now, I couldn't see the colors with my naked eye. Every frame of this time lapse is a 20 second exposure. And look at that. See the pillars? And see those green blobs? Again, those are illustrating what would otherwise be invisible. The position and the strength or the strongest locations of the electromagnetic field of our planet. That yellow glow you see is the Yakima. That's light pollution. The yellow because of high pressure sodium lights. This is also a lesson in spectroscopy. So we got yellow sodium, green oxygen, and pink nitrogen. You know, lightning is also pink for the same reason, because uh, you have ionizing plasma nitrogen. So here's some lightning over our North Dome. This is the old North Dome from the old facility. And the reason lightning is that pink color is because air is mostly nitrogen, being ionized by high voltage in this case, much lower in the atmosphere, not by high energy particles from the sun. Any aurora questions? It is inherently an electromagnetic topic to discuss the aurora, and uh, it definitely is not out of place. Questions about that? How fast does aurora move? It, it varies tremendously. It can move hundreds of miles per hour to tens of thousands of miles per hour. It depends on how agitated Earth's magnetic field, whether or not we're in what's known as a geomagnetic storm. Uh, during a geomagnetic storm, Earth's magnetic field has been heavily disrupted. And it will move and shake and change shape rapidly and vigorously because it's trying to correct itself. Because the inner core is gener or excuse me, the outer core is generating this field and it wants to be a certain orientation. Meanwhile, solar wind is trying to force it to be something else. Quick question. What's the latest knowledge about sound coming from the aurora? Yeah, so it turns out that the aurora actually produces ultra-low frequency sound, which you can uh, detect with a, a special audio recorder that can detect ultra-low frequency sound and upconvert it to audible wavelengths. And uh, we don't know why. I mean, it's not that surprising because the material will be expanding and contracting as it's heated. By the way, you might be surprised. The air molecules in question are being heated to hundreds of thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. That may sound impossible, but don't forget something we talked about in a previous show about temperature. Even though individual atoms in the aurora may be enormously energetic, they won't be able to convey a lot of heat to a target because there's so few of them. Because this is happening 80 miles up, the air is very thin. And that's, by the way, the reason the aurora can occur. Because at pressures that low, the particles that do exist are easily agitated by these particles from the sun. You would never have the aurora on Earth's surface because the energy required to produce it would be, you know, cataclysmic. It would be something very, very frightening indeed would be going on if you ever witness aurora on the ground. Uh, you probably would not be alive to witness such an event. Uh, please don't worry about that. By the way, if the magnetic field of Earth collapses, then yes, we would lose the aurora because the field would not be collecting or concentrating particles in very specific regions of the atmosphere. You might get... Sky glow still. Sky glow is actually a uh, chemical reaction phenomenon. So it looks like aurora. That it wouldn't be. You wouldn't see these beautiful bands and pillars like you do. Can aurora harm people? No. You could fly right through it. You wouldn't feel anything. Does everyone see the same colors? Well, aurora is primarily pink and green. Although sometimes you'll see red, and that's again based on what it's made out of. We're talking about air being ionized into a plasma. Speaking of which, I got a ball here. Check this down. Full of low pressure oxygen. Notice the color. I am ionizing the oxygen with a 5,000 volt Tesla coil at about 20,000 hertz. See that? Yeah. I might have a video of that for you. Check this fun out. So, so this is the ball I was just showing you. Here's some video of it. Notice how dynamic the plasma moves. That's going to come up in the next minute or two. We're going to talk about plasma very much in a minute because it has a lot to do with this show. The reason that plasma moves in such a dynamic manner is because it is charged. You have an extraordinarily conductive state of matter where all of the atoms are ionized, so they are extremely readily available to transfer electrons, either to uh, gain one that's been lost or add one. 
uh, the or lose one that's too extra, for example, too many. So plasma is always in a state of high electrical conduction because you have you have ions that are rapidly trying to deionize to return to their ground state. Because you have electrical current flowing and you have electrons moving, this plasma itself, the streamers, will have their own polarity. They will produce their own fields. And this causes the plasma to interact with itself, essentially. And that's why it looks so, let's say, alive. It looks, looks very uh, almost chaotic because it is affecting itself. Here's a different video, same thing. A little bit zoomed out. Notice I got some other gizmos in the background there. The, uh, the orange is neon. And that, that pinkish purple is hydrogen. There's my hand moving. I just picked up a light bulb. That's full of neon. See the orange color there? The green is actually uranium in a side of a glass vial that's uh, full of mercury vapor, which gives up ultraviolet light, which excites the uranium. Notice I'm moving the electrons around there. Plasma is a lot of fun. I like plasma. And it's good for teaching high energy physics. And it also has a lot to do with this program. Before I get on to that topic, I've talked quite a bit about the Earth. Are there any questions about Earth's electromagnetic field before I move on to other planets? Questions? The southern lights have blue. So the blue is often, illusion, and often an illusion created by Rayleigh scattering and uh, filtration. Uh, it, can, it can be the result of carbon dioxide emission, but that's very unusual. Uh, it has to be a very powerful geomagnetic storm for that to occur. Yeah. So uh, one last thing about Earth, just if it interests you, some, we have some geologists in the room tonight. Um, in addition to Earth's core, there is a, what we call lithospheric anomalies. So actual Earth rocks, because they, they contain varying amounts of metals, will become magnetized by Earth's magnetic field. Very tiny amounts, by the way. This NT refers to nano Teslas. So a billionth of a Tesla. If you have no idea what a Tesla is, we're not talking about the cars, but they are named after the very famous man, Nikola Tesla. It is a unit of electromagnetic flux density. Tesla tends to be a very large unit, and so we tend to convey them in nano Teslas or micro Teslas. So just be aware, there is some variation in Earth's magnetic field strength on the surface because of what Earth is made out of. However, this is not the primary reason we have a field. Questions about that? So on that subject, since we have the T on here, the tes Teslas or nano Teslas, let me give you some examples of objects so you can get some context in your head. Earth's magnetic field is quite weak. It's about 31.86 micro Teslas, so uh, a millionth of a Tesla. A typical refrigerator magnet is about five milliteslas, so five one thousandths of a Tesla. Again, you can see how big Teslas are as a unit. So a refrigerator magnet, five one millionth, or excuse me, one thousandth. Earth's is 31.8, let's just say 32 millionths of a Tesla. If you have a very high quality magnet, for example, where'd it go? I have one right here. Did I lose my powerful magnet during a show about magnet? It's actually fine if I did, because it doesn't really matter. But yeah, the, uh, that is annoying though. Anyway, if you have ever taken apart a hard drive before, you will find a very high quality magnet inside of it. Those high quality neodymium magnets can have a pretty strong field, 1.25 Teslas at their surface. And then you have things like MRI machines, which can have 1.5 to 17 Teslas. You may have seen some very entertaining videos on the internet of people getting tools sucked into an MRI machine while it was operating, or a whole uh, office chair. Actually, I might just have a video like that for you. Let's see, where did I put that? While you guys are uh, th talking about that. Oh yeah, check it out. Let's, see, let's be silly for a second here. Four Tesla magnet. So here is a, a, a wrench that is being suspended outside of an MRI machine. And it's uh, providing about 300 pounds of force, if I recall, on the little gauge they have attached to it. Let's see, they're gonna show the gauge right now, I think. Maybe not, let's see. Yeah, well, over 400 now, five, 500 pounds of force. So that wrench is being pulled with a force of 500 pounds. Here's an office chair. We have a magic floating office chair here. Let's see here, look at that, up to 1,200 pounds. I think they get it up to 2,000 pounds of force. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. 2,000 pounds. So that chair weighs about as much as a car right now because of the powerful electromagnetic field being produced. Look at that right there. About the same as a car being produced by an MRI machine. So humans can produce some pretty strong artificial magnetic fields. 
The Large Hadron Collider, the famous uh, particle accelerator, has about eight Teslas power. And amusing little factoid while I was researching this, it takes 16 Tesla of magnetic field power to levitate a frog. Now, a frog is not considered a good conductor. A frog is not made of metal. But at, at Tesla density, at magnetic density that intense, induction can occur within the frog's body, and a frog will levitate above uh, a powerful electromagnet at that strength. So it probably won't be very good for the frog, though, so don't do that at home. Yeah. Um, and then we have some natural objects in space that, that have enormously stronger uh, magnetic fields that we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah, so I just want to give you some context for these numbers in terms of Tesla strength. Questions about that? Very impressive forces. I don't know, but is it 10,000 gauss? That's interesting if true. I, I, that sounds about right, but I didn't think they were that related to each other. By the way, magnetic fields that strong can actually hurt you. Like it can actually, you know, uh, pull on the iron in your uh, blood or your bones and cause injury. We'll get to that in a second, why you might want to avoid certain very strong electromagnetic objects. Okay, now, I, you know, I'm, it occurs to me we're going pretty long, so I need to start speeding it up, although there isn't that much left. We talked about Earth's magnetic field. Now let's talk about other planets. Now, notice there are a few planets missing. We don't have Mercury on this chart. We don't have Venus on this chart. We don't have Mars on this chart. And that's because those three planets have extremely, extremely, extremely weak magnetic fields. So look here. We got 31,000 nanoteslas for Earth. Jupiter, 428,000 nanoteslas. Saturn, 22,000 nanoteslas. Uranus, 23,000 nanoteslas. Neptune, 13,000. As you can see, Earth has the second strongest magnetic field in our solar system when it comes to planets. Jupiter, not surprisingly, has the strongest field. Jupiter's field is so strong that it can excite material, and we can actually uh, measure the field via the glowing particles within Jupiter's geomagnetic field. Also, I shouldn't say geo. It's planetary magnetic field. Geo implies Earth, doesn't it? So let me show you something really quick. I have a picture of that. You may have seen this picture in one of my other presentations. So here we have Jupiter in visible light, and then here we have Jupiter in radio wavelengths. Jupiter's magnetic field is so strong that it's exciting particles in Jupiter's orbit enough to glow in radio wavelengths. Yeah. What's so amazing and interesting about this chart is how bizarrely off-center the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune are. Notice that the, the South Pole the, is almost being generated from the surface of Neptune. Look at that. Look how off-center. And by the way, look how incredibly disagreement, look at the, the incredible disagreement between the, the axis of rotation and the magnetic axis. Amazing. The reason for this is interesting. In the case of these bodies, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, it is not a biphasic iron core responsible for their magnetic field, but rather plasma. Because within these bodies, the pressures and temperatures are so intense that the gases they are mostly made up in of are not in a gaseous state, but a plasma state. Now, as we discussed earlier, plasma is enormously conductive because it is comprised of ions. And so trillions upon trillions upon trillions of amps of electrical current are flowing through the plasma within these bodies, and this produces a magnetic field. We do not know why the fields of Uranus and Neptune in particular are so weird. Might be indication of uh, impact. We don't know. Any questions about that? I'm going to start speeding it up a bit. I think that's fun. Okay. Let's talk about the sun then. The sun has a powerful magnetic field. Behold. This is a remarkable map of the sun's electromagnetic field. Notice how complicated it is. Notice how chaotic it is. Now, this was generated back in 2017. And this map would not have been useful even a few days after it was generated because the sun's electromagnetic field is constantly, constantly changing. And that's because not only is the plasma, not only is plasma responsible for its generation, that plasma moves in very complicated ways because the sun does not move uniformly. Its equator actually goes faster than the rest of it, and this twists up these lines of flux, and they do all sorts of interesting things. Notice these, what we call flux tubes, where we have magnetic fields being twisted up like braids. These fields can become very powerful, and when they release their energy, we see violent solar phenomena like, for example, solar flares. Now, the sun's corona, if you will, the atmosphere of the sun, air quotes, adheres to the boundaries of the electromagnetic field. 
So the sun's plasma, again, atmosphere, if you want to use that word, is compelled to take on a certain structure, a certain shape, because of the sun's magnetic field. The sun's magnetic field has much in common with the gas giant magnetic fields in that it's, res it's resultant from plasma and not from an iron core. Are there any questions about that? Now, the sun's magnetic field is extremely far-reaching. In fact, it defines the domain of the sun. We refer to that as the heliosphere. So this is obviously a three-dimensional virtual CGI thing, a little uh, a teaching aid. And it shows you the extent of the heliosphere. This region here is called the heliopause. And this is the region where we see a transition from the sun's magnetic field to the interstellar electromagnetic field. Earth plows through fields of interstellar gas and dust. And our magnetic field creates this sort of bow shock at the front. This compression of material causes heating and density increases, and that can be measured by space probes like the famous Voyagers. We know that the Voyagers essentially left our solar system when they stopped detecting the sun's magnetic field and instead began to detect the interstellar magnetic field, which, by the way, is a function of the galaxy as a whole. So yeah, our sun plows through this interstellar medium, as do many other stars. Check this out. This is a beautiful image of a bow shock. This is a real picture of a star. This star is moving through the Milky Way galaxy, and material, interstellar gas and dust, mostly hydrogen, is piling up in front of it. Here's another one. Look at this beautiful picture. This is a real picture. This is the star Zeta at Ophiuchi, and Zeta at Ophiuchi has an extremely prominent bow shock, and you can actually image this with a relative, relatively, a relatively available off-the-shelf equipment. This is one of the more impressive bow shocks in the sky. It's relatively bright. Here's four more bow shocks. These are all examples of stars that are plowing through the interstellar medium, and the extent of their electromagnetic fields is what determines the boundary of interface. So, instead of calling it the heliosphere, which we normally would, which refers to the sun, we would refer to these as the astrospheres. The electromagnetic domain of these stars determines their influence. The stronger the magnetic field, the bigger the astrosphere, uh, the larger the bow shock, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions about that? If you're wondering why this, why this bow shock happens, don't forget the stars in this radius of our galaxy are moving at about half a million miles per hour. So these stars are plowing through the interstellar medium at half a million miles per hour. That is true of the sun as well. By the way, speaking of the sun, this is a drawing of the sun's heliosphere, what we call the heliospheric current sheet. And this is uh, essentially a plasma distribution that spirals and twists because the sun, of course, rotates in about 25 days. So the rotation of the sun causes not only its magnetic domain to twist, but any plasma trapped in it. So the solar wind does not move out uniformly in all directions. It kind of creates this twisting candy cane effect. Questions about that? Someone just brought up the end of the show. We're going to get to that in a second. Uh, we're going to talk about neutron stars in a second. I meant, does the sun have magnetic pole? Yes, the sun does have a north and south pole, but every 11 years it flips. Every 11 years the sun's electromagnetic field flips. Much more rapidly than Earth's, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And by the way, I'm not going to talk about that too much because we're going to talk about the sun during one of our upcoming shows and we will discuss the mechanism in greater detail behind solar pole shifts. Yes. Questions? Question? Yeah, it's right there. Someone mentioned it. Very good. Now, SOFIA, the airplane telescope. There is an infrared telescope on SOFIA that studies the sky and, of course, as the name implies, infrared wavelengths. It flies at a high enough altitude that infrared wavelengths penetrate the atmosphere deeply enough to study. And SOFIA has made an important discovery. The magnetic fields of galaxies, distant galaxies beyond our own Milky Way, can be determined by the way the magnetic fields polarize photons moving through them. So here we have galaxy NGC 1068, and these blue lines indicate electromagnetic polarity. Check this out. We've discovered that different types of galaxies have different magnetic field behaviors. So, for example, M82 is what we call a starburst galaxy. This is a galaxy that is actively forming baby stars. It has a substantial outflow of particles being pushed away by the stellar winds of these millions of brand new baby stars. And as a result, we see this sort of polarized magnetic field that seems to agree with the, let's say, polar distribution of that galaxy. But then we have an ancient spiral galaxy here that is not a starburst galaxy. It's not in the process of actively producing huge numbers of baby stars. And we don't see that same outflow. So 
believe it or not, we can now study and map the magnetic fields of distant galaxies and, and determine the nature of the galaxy's behavior by determining the way photons of light are affected by those magnetic fields. This is a big deal. This is a pretty astonishing and pretty new technology, and it's teaching us a whole bunch of new, of new things about galaxies. It's important to understand that you have to come up with these clever mechanisms to, find, to study magnetism because if you're not within the midst of a magnetic field, you cannot measure it. Aren't we clever? Questions about that? Okay, so now we're going to wrap up the show with uh, something exciting. We're going to talk about this thing. This is an artistic interpretation of a white dwarf star. White dwarfs are collapsed intermediate or low mass stars. They tend to have very strong magnetic fields. Uh, about 100 Teslas, 100 Tesla magnetic field around a, a white dwarf star. Our sun will become a, a white dwarf one day. Part of the reason their magnetic fields are so strong is because electrons are running wild. The temperatures are enormous. These stars are in the millions of degrees. They're dead, by the way. This is a dead star, and yet it's very hot. Fusion has ceased, but it contains residual heat and will do so for eons. Uh, you may have heard from a different show we did that white dwarfs will be among the last hot things in the cosmos because they lose heat so slowly by infrared radiation. So yeah, the enormous temperatures cause the atoms that make up the white dwarf to become so agitated that the electrons just fly all over the place. And so we have untold quadrillions of amps of electrical current flowing, and that is what's responsible for the powerful magnetic field. By the way, white dwarfs are about the size of Earth, give or take. Maybe a few Earths, maybe a little bit less than Earth, depending on how massive their progenitor star was. I'm going to move on to neutron stars next, but are there any questions about white dwarfs? I repeat, our sun will become one one day. This is the most common type of dead star, because most stars in the cosmos are either low or intermediate mass, and that is what they become. Low or intermediate mass stars collapse into white dwarfs, non-fusing stellar remnants at the end of their life cycles, comprised almost entirely of carbon and oxygen. This would be an example of a, a carbon-oxygen white dwarf. They also, if they're a very low mass star, they can even be, contain a great deal of helium that was not fused during the end of the star's life cycle. Our sun does have sufficient mass to fuse helium at the end of its life, so it won't become a helium white dwarf, although it will contain some. All right, last chance to qu ask questions about white dwarfs, and I'm going to get to the neutron stars. White dwarf questions. All right, let's get to the exciting part. I saved the best for last. One of my favorite types of objects in the cosmos, an enormously extreme type of object. What's this thing? I'm not going to tell you. What are you looking at here? What is, by the way, this is not real. This is a, this is a simulation, although it is, it is an a information-based artistic rendering of one of these things. What are we looking at? What is this object? Yeah, a lot of good questions. Oh, very good. Someone said pulsar. And someone said neutron star. You're both right, because pulsars are neutron stars. All right, listen up. Neutron stars, like white dwarfs, are enormously compressed and enormously hot, although enormously more so because they are so much heavier. Neutron stars are the remnants of supermassive stars that collapsed. They're not massive enough to become black holes, but they are massive enough to crush their cores down to the size of about a city. Incredibly, this object is about 20 miles across, and yet it contains sometimes multiple solar masses. Neutron stars are absolutely mind-boggling objects when it comes to their density. Their gravity is such that if you were to uh, fall into one, you'd be approaching about 10% the speed of light when you struck the surface. That would be a very violent event. Um, neutron stars, because of the enormous numbers of free electrons flying around that have been dislodged from their incredibly agitated atoms, which, by the way, include a great deal of iron atoms, are among the most electromagnetically active objects in the universe. I, I don't want to put a name or a word on the amount of electrical current, because I'd probably be wrong, but it's going to be more than quadrillions of amps of current are flowing across their surface. This, is result, this results in an enormously powerful magnetic field. And because the field is so strong, it can excite particles to emit electromagnetic radiation. And that's what you're seeing here in these beams of light. Pulsars don't actually pulsate. They appear to do so because they spin, and by random chance, we might be in the, the field of view of their, of their jet 
of high energy uh, photons. And so if we, if, if these uh, jets, so to speak, or these, a better word is beams, not jets, these beams of radiation wash over the Earth, the neutron star appears to pulsate. Neutron stars can spin very, very quickly. There are millisecond pulsars. So that means pulsars that are spinning thousands of times a second. It's hard to imagine something that massive spinning that quickly. But the reason they do so is because they start out as a huge spinning star, and as they shrink, their RPM, so to speak, their rotational velocity increases due to the conservation of angular momentum. So spinning neutron stars emit incredibly powerful magnetic fields and also, as a result, incredibly powerful electromagnetic rays caused by particles trapped in the field or washed over by the fields, glowing intensely. Now, a neutron star can have a magnetic field strength of 1 to 100 million Teslas. So 1 to 100 million Teslas. By the way, what did I say Earth's field was? 31.8 micro Teslas. And yet, these are not the strongest electromagnets in the cosmos because there is one more type of object, the magnetar, which is an exceptionally electromagnetically active neutron star. Magnetars can be up to 100 billion Teslas in electromagnetic strength. Their, their lowest cutoff, their, their threshold is 100 million. So once you go from neutron star, 100 million, after that we refer to it as a magnetar. So you can go from 100 million Tesla to 100 billion Tesla. I want to repeat, magnetars are the most powerful electromagnetic objects in the universe, and that's why we call them magnetars. They have the word magnet in them. I like to think of, of magnetars as the black holes of electromagnetism because, of course, black holes are associated with extraordinary gravity due to their mass. Magnetars are associated with extraordinary electromagnetism. They are so powerful that they are responsible for gamma ray bursts. Not all gamma ray bursts, but some gamma ray bursts and flashes are caused by these magnetic fields exciting particles so much that they actually increase in temperature to trillions of degrees, if you can believe that, and they will emit gamma radiation, and also lots of x-rays. That's one of the ways we find magnetars and realize, and that's how we figured out they were so extraordinary and so exceptional, because the electromagnetic radiation they emit is so extraordinarily intense. So yeah, magnetars are rare. We only know of a few dozen of them. And uh, they are associated with extremely intense radiation because the magnetic fields that surround them are extremely intense. Any questions about that? I want to repeat, yes, as Ed points out, 100 billion Teslas compared to uh, what, what was an object that was kind of close. So uh, refrigerator magnet is one five, five one thousandths of a Tesla. That, uh, that uh, video you saw of the MRI machine eating the chair, that was four Teslas. So 100 billion ver uh, versus four. What about star quakes? Well, those aren't the, I mean, star quakes are real. They uh, stars have dynamic surfaces that move, and they are like a fluid medium. Oh, by the way, stars behave like a fluid because of electromagnetism. We refer to the stellar plasma as an electromagnetohydrodynamic fluid. It acts like a fluid, although it isn't one, because it's charged. So you have particles moving over and under each other and pushing each other away or attracting each other. And sudden changes can cause sudden movement of the stellar material, and that would be, quote, a, quote, a, a star quake. Yeah. So that, was, that doesn't really apply to neutron stars, though. Do black holes have magnetic fields? The, as far as we know, the, the black hole itself does not. However, the accretion disk around the black hole has an extremely powerful magnetic field. And you might be aware that supermassive black holes, ironically, even though they're the darkest things in nature, uh, emit some of the, the most light because their accretion disks around them are extraordinarily luminous. That's what, a, that's what a quasar is. Quasars are the extremely luminous accretion disks of material being devoured by a supermassive black hole. Those reside at the centers of galaxies. Those are more violent in terms of gravitational attraction than neutron stars. Any magnetars in our galaxy? Yes, yes, we've detected uh, uh, several dozen yeah, in our galaxy. Yeah. None, none of them are close to us. Yeah. Uh, we have detected them in other galaxies as well, which is kind of impressive when you think about it. Detecting something that's 20 miles across, millions of light years away, because it's so powerful that it makes its presence known with great aplomb. Yeah. All right, we went a little bit over time tonight. I apologize for that. Uh, although I did cover everything, I didn't skip anything. I'm gonna let's do five more minutes of questions and answer time, then I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm gonna leave this exciting animation on the screen. 
I'm going to look for material I may have forgotten to share with you. Mm -hmm. Questions, questions. By the way, we don't completely understand why magnetars are so powerful. We understand that it's just more of everything of a typical neutron star. But there may be some other mechanism at work that we're not aware of. They are extraordinary objects. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I forgot what our next show is. Let's see. Oh, hey, perfect timing. It's almost like we planned that. So next week we'll be talking about the sun. And we might be answering some of the questions that cropped up about our sun, including its electromagnetism. I'll give you a hint right now. Almost all of the surface activity we observe on the sun is electromagnetic in nature even though it's window dressing, so to speak, because it doesn't entail fusion, which is the power source of a star, that activity at the surface is caused by electromagnetic fields. Uh-oh, that's impossible. Hmm. It just says the stream has been blocked because of copyright audio. That it cannot possibly be accurate. But anyway, let me, uh, can you guys still hear me right now? I think that must be an incorrect message. <laughs> Can you all still see and hear me? Yeah. Let me put up a less controversial picture just in case it's uh, flagging that. Let's, let's go back to that animation of the heliosphere. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, well, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Last chance for questions, guys. Electromagnetic field questions. Anything, anything you want to know, let me know. How about if you were in the middle? If you were in the middle of a neutron star, you would be converted into neutrons because the gravity is so intense in this inside of a neutron star that protons and electrons combine to form new neutrons, and the neutrons physically touch each other. That may not sound like a strange statement. You think, oh, everything touches everything. No. Because of electromagnetism, that force of nature we've talked about tonight, no atoms touch. Did you know that your body is full of atoms and molecules that are not touching each other? because they all electromagnetically repel one another. But the gravity of neutron stars is so extraordinarily intense that neutrons are compelled to touch one another. As a result, sometimes people refer to neutron stars as giant molecules. Interesting. Yeah, and you, you, the, cr the pressure would absolutely crush you, yes. Good question. Two more minutes, guys. Give me some questions to answer. Did anything come up? You said some of you say you learned some things, uh, new things. Uh, anything you want to expand upon? We have plenty to talk about. Yeah, that's interesting. Policy violation, that's weird. Well, apparently some people got cut off, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start signing off then. That's a very strange thing. And not, I don't know why I would do that. Well, I'm going to then... Oh, I'm back. Oh, thank you. That is so strange. So, let me go back to my main screen. This has been a fun topic. I uh, got to talk about some extreme physics. We don't talk about electromagnetism as much as we talk about gravity and astronomy, and we really shouldn't uh, make that omission because uh, many of the phenomena we observe in the cosmos are electromagnetic in nature. Well, I am going to, uh, with that begin to sign off. I'll give you 30 more seconds. You're back. Bye. And I'll see you next week at, on Sunday at 7 o'clock. We'll be talking about the sun. And uh, it's a topic we love to discuss here at Goldendale Observatory. We have solar telescopes, so some of the footage you will see was taken or shot here. And uh, I almost can guarantee you will learn something new about the sun if you tune in next week at 7 o'clock. So, if you had fun tonight, like and subscribe, and I will see you next week.